Well, today we're continuing our series in the Old Testament book of Daniel, and uh, we're on. We're going to be looking at chapter four today. We've we've had uh, four other messages that have uh, kind of walked through the, the 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 book of Daniel, and we realize that when we look into the Old Testament, when we look into the New Testament, we're looking not only at God's word, but we're also looking at God's uh, God's involvement with people throughout history. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to think of it in, 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 in those ways because this is, this is real life stuff, things that really took place in time and space. And uh, I was reminded, somebody gave me uh, a, a recent National Geographic magazine this week, and um, that it was, a, it was, the, it was a, a, an expose on King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it was very interesting to see the, the historical, the archaeology, the, 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 the background that's, that's both National Geographic, but, but interestingly enough, one of the main places that they quoted was the book of Daniel to, for them to get a... a, a a lot of their information from, a lot of their co- comparing back and forth. This is what historians tell us about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, by the way, this is the last week we're going to have to deal with spelling that name. So that's the, uh, anybody that has two Z's in their last name is a, is a, is a, is a problem, isn't that? Isn't that the way it is? But uh, he was an incredible warrior, and he was an extraordinary builder. Uh, he built so many buildings and structures in Babylon his capital city, that one source tells us that it took 126 pages just to record the inscriptions on the stones that have been found so far. That's a lot when you think about it. And he built one of the so-called seven wonders of the ancient world, although we don't have any real pictures of it. Uh, uh, Archaeologists have put together several renditions of what it could have looked like. It's called, the seven, it's called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And they're thought to be constructed by Nebuchadnezzar as a present to his wife who missed the trees of her mountainous homeland. And so he built a system of suspended gardens with irrigation systems for her. Now, that might not be that big of a deal today, but that was what? 586 B.C.? That's a long time ago that that took place. The city of Babylon was surrounded by a double wall that was 56 miles long in the perimeter of the city. And it was so wide on the top, it says that you could turn a four-horse chariot on the top of that wall. that's 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 a very, very, very wide wall. And history shows us that his focus, like many kings seemed to be on making it as big and extravagant and as opulent as he could possibly do. And uh, we read about that a little bit in this chapter this morning, in verse 4, and then again in verses 29 and 30. It, it, it says, in verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar is re- actually re- re- recording this. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. And then a little bit later in verse 29, it says, 12 months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. Whoa. (laughs) Whoa. Evidently, Nebuchadnezzar had this habit of sort of taking a stroll out on his patio to admire uh, all of his own handiwork by his own mighty power built for his own glory. He was pleased and he was prosperous. Did Nebuchadnezzar think he had a problem? Not really. Not so much. Quite the contrary, actually. Did God think he had a problem? Well, let's see. Let's see. God and Nebuchadnezzar are about to embark on an adventure that will be the battle for his life and even for his soul. Nebuchadnezzar had been in many military battles before, 
But this one was going to be a far more difficult battle, far more difficult than any of the others he'd ever been in. Reminded me of a passage in the New Testament where Jesus said, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world? But then, what does he say? But lose your soul. But lose your soul. So let's move on and start at verse 10. We're going to be reading through the passage this morning. Daniel tells us that Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. That seems to be Daniel's specialty in this book. Verse 10, he says, I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade, and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. So he calls Daniel in to interpret this dream, and this is what Daniel tells him a little bit later. He said, that tree, your majesty, is you. So far, it's good news. (laughs) For you have grown up strong and great, and your greatness reaches up to the heaven, and your rule to the ends of the earth. Everyone is looking up to Nebuchadnezzar. He's that tall tree in the middle of the dream. People look to you, Nebuchadnezzar, to provide food and shelter. You are politically and militarily powerful to the ends of the earth. It's a picture of a proud, self-sufficient person. I don't need anyone or anything else. But there's not even a hint of dependence on God. No understanding that true leadership is all about being a servant and that He has been given so much and will be accountable for all that he has. To much whom much has been given, much is expected. Pride causes an illusion of self-sufficiency. Reminded me a story of a uh, 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 of, of a of a pastor at the conclusion of a, of the sermon. The worshipers filed out on this particular day at the sanctuary to meet the meet the minister, and as one of them left, he shook the minister's hand and thanked him for the sermon and said, Pastor, thank you so much for the message. You know, you must be smarter than Einstein. And he paused and sort of beamed with pride, the pastor did, and said, Why, thank you, brother. That's a kind thing for you to say. As the week went by, the minister began to think about that, that, that what the man had just said, the man's compliment, and the more he thought about it, the more baffled he became as to why Anyone would deem him smarter than Einstein. So he decided to ask the man the following Sunday. The next Sunday, he asked the man if he remembered the previous Sunday's comment about the sermon. And the man replied, oh, yeah, I did. I did. I do remember it. The minister asked, exactly what did you mean by me being smarter than Einstein? And the man replied, well, pastor, they say that Einstein was so smart that only 10 people in the entire world can understand him. Well, congratulations, Pastor. No one can understand you. <laughs> sort of shot him down right there. With it. <laughs> so the text says that Daniel's troubled about his dream, and his face shows it as he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. But give the king credit here. He sees Daniel's body language, and he trusts Daniel. Daniel and he have walked a lot of miles together. And in verse 9, He says in so many words, okay, Daniel, I see your face. Give it to me straight. Give it to me straight. He didn't say, tell me what it means and it better be good or it's off with your head. Some some kings would do that. No, he wanted the truth. No fake truth here, the real truth. People who we can trust to tell us the real truth are to be treasured, aren't they? Jesus says the truth sets us free. There is a Second part of the dream. The tree is cut down to the stump, and suddenly the fresh green leaves and branches and all the fruit are gone. The animals desert it. No more birds living under this tree. The stump is left alone. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, he said, like you were the tree, you are also the stump. And all this power and glory and stuff that you've accumulated and built, You're going to lose it all until you learn. You may think that you're in control, but you're not. And in verse 4, 
chapter 4, verse 25, he says, Until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That's the lesson that he needed to learn. But Daniel's not done yet. King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, please accept my advice. Don't you just love Daniel? I mean, he's talking to the most powerful guy in the whole world at this time. And he says, please accept my advice. And the interpretation gets even tougher. He says, stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past. As I said, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar have some history together. And Daniel is speaking the truth out of this relationship with Nebuchadnezzar not out of hatred, but out of respect. He does not pull any punches here. Daniel cares about Nebuchadnezzar, but at the same time, he, he gives him some tough love. He says, you're a wicked man, Nebuchadnezzar. Let me finish what Daniel said to him. He said, stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. He's speaking the truth to a very powerful person, and Daniel's not just saying to Nebuchadnezzar, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, you see that statue over there that you've been bowing to? You need to bow to a different statue. No, he's saying God cares about how you live. Your life is so centered on you, Nebuchadnezzar, on your pride, on your glory. And when we really understand the call of God on our lives, when we really become serious about getting right with God, when we really understand what the free gift of forgiveness is and what a new life is all about, there is a painful part of this because we realize that the world does not revolve around my wishes and my comfort. God says, leave that behind. Leave that behind. But honestly, that's impossible without God's help. When other people like politicians and public figures are exposed for this sort of thing, we're outraged and we say, my goodness, they're getting exactly what they deserve. But we look inside and say, well, that's not me. But honestly, none of us are without fault. Daniel's bringing it to light. He asked Nebuchadnezzar, are you willing to listen? Are you willing to humble yourself, to confess your sin, to admit your need of God's forgiveness and a new direction in your life? And he specifically says in Nebuchadnezzar, in your kingdom, you're neglecting the poor. You're neglecting the poor. Daniel's doing some serious meddling here in Nebuchadnezzar's business. He's messing with how much money Nebuchadnezzar is putting into his buildings and his beautiful hanging gardens and with the walls and the palaces and the inscription. Daniel is calling Nebuchadnezzar to, to worship the one and only true God. And he said, show it by your actions. Show it by your actions. The one behavior that Daniel, on behalf of God, calls him to task is how he's treating the under-resourced in his kingdom. God is calling Nebuchadnezzar to take a look at all the goodness that he has received, all the accumulations, and then to humbly look at how he can grow in his treating of under-resourced people. Daniel gives him the message that runs consistent all the way through God's word to, to notice, to love, and to serve people that Jesus often called the least of these. Do justice, Nebuchadnezzar. Do what's right. See, God breaks the heart of attentive Christ followers for, and they see the plight of those that are needy, the plight of the poor, the, part, the plight of the under-resourced. Where's your heart today with that? Where are your actions? Do your actions reflect that God has broken your heart? Are you listening? How did Nebuchadnezzar respond? Well, let's reread that passage from, it comes next in sequence, verse 28. It says, but all these things did happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon, as I looked across my great city, he said, look at all this great city of Babylon. By my own power, 
I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. How is Nebuchadnezzar doing with the pride and humility thing? <laughs> uh, for 12 months, he wakes up every morning and he, did he forget the dream that Daniel interpreted for him? He continues to pursue his self-centered life. Maybe he thought, well, it's just a dream. Maybe God was just kidding. Maybe I can outsmart God. Maybe if I just forget about it, it'll go away. Kind of reminds me of a book I remember that was published back in the early, uh, the late 1960s, written by a young pro quarterback. See if you can tell me who wrote this book. It says, the title of the book is, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> who wrote that? Joe Namath, that's right, Joe Namath. Nebuchadnezzar probably could have co-authored that, authored that book. Probably so. Like a good parent, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a choice. You can understand reality the easy way, by responding to my words, or you will understand in a much more painful way. Actually, when we think about God's parenting, God is much better at it than we are. As, as parents, we tend to lower our standards. I, I've confessed this to you before, this sin before, before that we're the parents of three children. When the, first, when the pacifier dropped for the first child, we boiled it, sterilized it, washed it, and air dried it before it got back in the child's mouth. Child number two, we'd run it under some running water. And child number three, we'd probably make sure that the bigger chunks are off of it before we put it back into the child's mouth. That's not consistent parenting, is it? But God is much better at it than we are. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God does not lower his standards. We think that God grades on a curve, the, the one that, that, that fits me. How much violence, selfishness, dishonesty, racism, greed is God willing to allow? Answer, well, just a little bit more than I'm involved in. Just a little bit more than I'm involved in. But in Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes this, and he says, gives kind of God's assessment of each of us and of the human race in general. He said, for everyone has sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. There's a word in there that makes me squirm. How about you? It's that word everyone. Everyone. Adolf Hitler. El Chapo. Mr. Putin. Nancy Pelosi. Mitch McConnell. I'm coming the other side. <laughs> President Trump. President Obama. Oprah, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. You and me. There's no such thing as good enough, is there? No such thing as good enough. In verse 31, we read, While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. He had to learn a painful way. We call it hitting the bottom, hitting the bottom. If we read about this, he endured seven years of torture as he suffered from a mental illness that is documented today. It drove him away from people and caused some very strange physical symptoms, some very strange behavior. You can read about it more in verses 31 to 33. But we read on. And the history tells us that Nebuchadnezzar had a turning point. He writes this. He says, After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honored, and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. Nebuchadnezzar is simply saying, I came to my senses in the middle of it all. I realized I was not self-sufficient. He realized 
he needed God. You see, God has this amazing gift for each person, and it's called grace. It's free, and no one can earn it. But in order to receive it, we have to honestly admit our need for God. You see, Nebuchadnezzar finally got to that place. He says, I looked up to heaven. I looked up to heaven. You see, God's heart is always a heart of grace. God is always ready to forgive. God's desire is for us to receive his love. That's Nebuchadnezzar's story. What's yours today? What's yours today? None of us can make things right with God between, between God and us by, by what would be called the performance plan. It's not by just going to church and striving to be nice and respectable. You see, God will never lower his standard. So he decided to lower himself. He sent his son into the world, Jesus, the carpenter, who humbled himself and became a person who, who even suffered death, the most horrid kind of death, death on a cross. And on the cross, Jesus was expressing both God's refusal to accept the ugliness of sin and God's willingness to suffer because of his love for imperfect people like you and like me. On that cross, Jesus was in some way paying the price for sin, for the sin of the world, for the sin of Nebuchadnezzar, and the sin of you and me. He died there, the, the death that by all rights I should have died. I should have. And anyone can be in a right relationship with God, not based on our performance, but based on what Jesus has already done. And you can know all of this in your head, but still not be in a right relationship with Jesus because it digs down deeper than that. It goes to the heart. It goes to the part of us that, that really connects with, with God. He wants a heart response. Will I follow or will I not? So here's your question today. Have you responded to Jesus? Have you responded to Jesus? I pray that the, the answer is a resounding absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. It's simple. It's simple to do it. It's not a formula. It's, I'm going to pray a prayer in a second, and it, this is not a magic prayer. It's not the, the only way to do it. You know how you speak with God, honestly, heart to heart. That's how it really takes place. It's between God and you. Why don't you just bow your head right now, and uh, we're going to pray. But once again, please know that this is not a magic formula. It's not taking medicine. It's, it's God calls us, our heart, to speak to the heart of God. Gracious God, I, I, I know that I'm not God, and... <laughs> And I know that I need you every day because I'm a sinner and I need your help. I know that I cannot solve this on my own by, uh, by trying to be good enough because I, I go south every day. I, I sin every day. My heart leads me in the wrong ways. My motivations are anything but pure. So I confess my need for your love and your compassion and your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, as, as best as I can understand, I, I want you, I take you at your word. I, I want you to be my forgiver. I want you to be my, my leader. And I want you to be my best friend. I really do want to follow you right now. We open up our hearts to you right now, Jesus. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.